Welcome to Logos Live. I'm Robert Martin, Director of the City Bible Forum in Melbourne, and I'm your host for the show. Logos is Greek for word or message, and Logos Live engages the Christian message before a live audience in the CBD of Melbourne. And do we have a live audience here today? Yes, we do. We have a few alive people out there. And we also aim to have a bit of fun. Who said exploring the big questions of life shouldn't be enjoyable? In 1882, the great German philosopher Friedrich Nietzsche made the controversial claim, God is dead. Has God been killed by his strongest opponents? In this series of Logos Live, God versus the World, we tackle some of the big objections to belief in God today. And today's objection is pleasure. Is God just a cosmic killjoy? And we're privileged to have Nick Coombs from City on a Hill join us. Now, Nick grew up in Melbourne and studied commerce at Deakin University. He worked for several years in a variety of roles for City on a Hill Church in Melbourne CBD. And he's currently City on a Hill Melbourne Executive Pastor, and he joins me now. Please welcome Nick Coombs. Thank you, Rob. Good to be here. It's great. You had a raucous welcome there from our audience here today. It's great that you can join us today. Um, Now, today we're talking about God versus pleasure, the claim that God is just a giant killjoy. Now, this was part of your experience growing up uh, in a Christian home, wasn't it? Can you maybe tell us a little bit about what happened and then what changed? Yeah, so I grew up uh, in a Christian home. My dad was a pastor, so I was a PK. And so I grew up uh, hearing about Jesus, hearing about Christianity, uh, but more so what I was taught, I caught a few things. And I think uh, one of those things was that God was not for my joy, not for my happiness, but rather uh, wanted to limit it, wanted to box me in, wanted to keep me from experiencing the joys that my friends around me uh, were experiencing. And just one example of that is that uh, growing up, I still do, I love uh, sport. Yep. And dad, being a pastor on Sundays, Sundays is a big day, meant that footy uh, here in Melbourne uh, I couldn't, be, couldn't play it on Sundays. I had to be in church. And for me, that was just, I guess, uh, tip of the iceberg. So you, for you, God was kind of killing your joy of sport? Yeah, totally. It felt like I was being boxed in and I wasn't really allowed to the, the freedom to do what I wanted. Mm-hmm. And so I guess I just projected that onto my view of God, that mm-hmm. God really wasn't about uh, having fun, but rather he was about ticking the boxes and about um, legalism and you know just, just doing what you're told. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so I did that. Uh, and so I got with the program and uh, went along to church and uh, up until about my high school years where it sort of became much more obvious the difference between how my friends were living and how uh, God or my parents wanted me uh, to live. Yep. Uh, that's when uh, I can remember consciously thinking to myself, uh, you know what, this, this whole uh, Jesus God thing, I'm going to uh, put that on the back burner, perhaps come back to that uh, after I've had my fun, after I've uh, experienced what I want to experience, then I'll uh, come back to that when I'm all uh, grown up and mature and, and you know, want to uh, join the knitting club and, and, and sing <laughs> songs and, and that kind of thing. Right. right. Uh, and so, yeah, so I, I sort of just lived the, the average kind of teenage existence of a, an average Aussie. Yep. Um, hung out with friends, uh, partied, uh, did what uh, I wanted to do. Um, but then but, something changed. You, joined, you yeah. didn't join the knitting, knitting club. No, I didn't. But what, 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 what happened? What changed? Uh, so I, up until that point, had been going along to my uh, parents' church, my dad's church, and um, uh, begrudgingly. Uh, and then... At about the age of 15, 16, I, I moved churches with my brother um, and we went to this more uh, charismatic church, people uh, happy uh, to be there. Happy? Happy to be there. I couldn't believe it. Uh, and so we went along to this and to, to be honest, it was totally corrective of my view of God because I saw people actually uh, enjoying Jesus, actually enjoying uh, God. And I, was, I guess that... Uh, the emotional satisfaction they were getting made a real impression on me. Uh, and it wasn't that now I understood that God wasn't uh, about uh, being a cosmic killjoy. He wasn't about uh, stifling my yeah. joy, but rather he was about fanning his flame and finding it in him. So you were surprised by their happiness? Yeah, totally. Uh, you know, people, even people experiencing deep pain, uh, still experiencing joy and happiness uh, in God. They were, they were happy to be Christians. They were happy to be reading the scriptures and, and 
um, yeah, it was... Uh, and that made a profound made a, impact yeah, on totally. you. Totally. Yeah. Made a very deep uh, and lasting, even to today, where I'm you know, working at a church. Yeah, that's right. You're working and you don't run a knitting club? No, I don't. No? Uh, <laughs> no, I, my heart hasn't been changed that much. Okay. <laughs> that's right. Nothing against knitting, by the way. If you love knitting, then we love you too. Um, now, you've described the problem we're discussing today, God versus pleasure, like putting a kid in a Mr. Whippy van and telling him not to touch the ice cream. Now, interestingly, if you type in Nick Coombs, Mr. Whippy in Google, um, this is actually the top quote that comes up. So it was your quote, was it? You wrote that? Or Yeah, in a sermon. In a, yeah. Yeah, yeah, okay, right. Anyway, but before we talk more specifically about pleasure and God, we do try to have a little bit of fun here at Logos Live. It's not a sin to laugh. And so I do have a, a short little quiz just to work out exactly how much you know about Mr. Whippy. Are you ready? Can I phone a friend or something? No, no, no. This is just for you. Maybe you could get our live audience here to help you if you're really struggling. Anyway, first question is, which English Prime Minister allegedly helped work on developing a recipe for improving soft serve ice cream? Was it A, Margaret Thatcher as a junior chemist working for the food manufacturer, Joe Lyons? Or was it B, Winston Churchill as an experiment in ice cream warfare? Or was it C, Gordon Brown as part of a program to make him more interesting? (laughs) I think all the English people laughed at that. I'm glad. <laughs> Nick, which one? I'm going to go with C, Gordon Brown. Ah, right. Well, actually, the answer is actually A, Margaret Thatcher. Apparently, she worked for a short time as a chemist, developing emulsifiers for ice creams for Joe Lyons from 1949 to 1951. Now, there's a lot of uncertainty over her exact role, uh, but people like to draw parallels with this and her political career. They suggest that to soft serve ice cream, Thatcher added air, lowered quality, and raised profits. Um, anyway, so uh, at least you've learned something today about Mr. Whippy ice cream. Yeah, yeah. Okay, the second question is, I hope we can get this one. This is actually a harder question than the first one. So what's the name of the musical tune that is most commonly associated with Mr. Whippy vans? I have absolutely no idea. In fact, your friend is phoning you, I think. It... The green sleeve. <laughs> the green... Or just green sleeves would be fine. Yeah, yeah, okay. Uh, Come on. uh, uh, Yeah, so give give Nick a clap for kind of getting that one right. Yeah, he's (laughs) sort of. That was all you wrote. Green sleeves. Actually, I I have no idea why they have that particular tune. Do you think they might have had a better tune? I was just thinking maybe what would be more appropriate perhaps for a Mr. Whippy van? Maybe something like American Pie or Mr. Weird Al Yankovic's Fat. Or eat it or something. Do you think? Or do you think that might have been better? Or well, you need to attract attract the children. Yeah, something. Do you something. think green sleeves attracts the children? I've run toward many Mr. Whippy <laughs> yeah. vans in my life. <laughs> Fair enough. So, do you even like Mr. Whippy ice cream? Uh, I like ice cream, right? In general, yeah. Uh, and Mr. Whippy seemed a good cultural connection, but I'm after all. Okay. Well, anyway, Nick, in our quiz today, uh, Mr. Whippy quiz, you got one out of two right, so you pass. So please give Nick a bit of a, a quick hand. Please get degrees. Come on. <laughs> That's right, peas. That was your experience at university as well, was it? Getting peas or... Okay, <laughs> yeah. we, we won't go there. Okay, now there's many pleasures in this world, including Mr. Whippy ice cream. Now, pleasure by definition is enjoyable. And uh, some have suggested that it's normal for people to seek after pleasure and happiness. Blaise Pascal said, All men seek happiness. This is without exception. This is the motive of every action of every man, even of those who hang themselves. So do you agree with Pascal? Do all people seek happiness? Well, speaking from my own experience, I know when we're, when we're thinking about our motivations, really we need to, can only really look back retrospectively. And mm-hmm. I think in my uh, experience, it definitely uh, plays out as true. And I think if I was to look outside of myself around uh, in our culture, I think the advertisers uh, probably you know, got their finger on the pulse here. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and they seem to uh, be all about trying to attract us because of our desire for happiness yeah. is there any that you can think of yeah i know recently um coke coca-cola yep. had a uh, happiness share happiness choose happiness yeah uh campaign which was all about bringing happiness to all parts of the world they've got a whole youtube campaign you can go online and, and watch those videos but they're trying to have you choose coke in order to choose happiness wow so that, but they're tapping in you're saying they're tapping into this desire this innate desire that we all have for happiness searching for pleasure yep totally i think uh I think Blaise Pascal is uh, on the money. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, I think all of us are searching for happiness. All of us will choose different things uh, in which to find that happiness. We might have different tastes uh, for that happiness. But I think uh, all of us have it. We're just looking in different places. So we all want happiness and pleasure. We all want, say, the ice cream, so to speak. 
But doesn't God say no? Now, your experience perhaps has, has changed this, but this is a, a perception that people have. You know, don't taste, don't touch. You know, it was certainly the case with the ascetics uh, and monks in the early church who renounced worldly pleasures. For example, Antony in the third century, he was born into a wealthy family, but he renounced his inheritance and made a vow to celibacy and went to live a solitary life of self-denial in the desert. So worldly enjoyments, pleasures, friends, money, food, sex are all given up, just like putting a kid in a Mr. Whippy van and telling him not to touch the ice cream. In fact, well, it's actually it's bigger than that. In fact, God tells him to sit on the roof and, uh, and meditate. You know, it's, This is kind of how some people view Christianity today. And that was even part of your own experience as well, not just growing up, but you had one particularly enjoyable day, didn't you, where you kind of felt this is too good to be true. Yeah, so I had grown up thinking, uh, yeah, totally, God was uh, about boxing me in and protecting me uh, from my joy. Mm. Uh, and I that continued even after I'd, uh, you know, called myself a Christian and was um, trying to obey and follow him. That, that view had kind of seeped in to my worldview. And so there was this one uh, particular time I was, uh, it, was, it was a perfect day. Are you a golfer, Rob? That's a, good, that's a hard question to answer. No, no, the answer is basically no. No, I'm not really a golfer, no. All right, it's no. Uh, so I was playing golf and I had my best mate with me and it was one of those days uh, that the sun was uh, everywhere. There was not a cloud in the sky. Uh, it was perfect. There was no wind. We had a golf buggy to drive around in, which just makes the game so much more enjoyable. Yep. Uh, and we had unlimited golf until the sun went down. Uh, and so it was perfect. And there was this, we were driving around on the golf course, having some fun, some enjoyment. Mm. Uh, and then there was this one moment where it was just uh, too good that we kind of looked at each other and, and said, uh, is, do you think, are we sinning right now? Is, is, we, we must be doing something that God doesn't like right now. This feels too good yeah. uh, to be true. Uh, and that kind of yeah, just revealed to me that actually underlining my worldview at the time, uh, I still sort of had the concept that God was not really happy with me enjoying myself. No, no, no. So so hasn't God put us in a world full of experiences to enjoy, but told us to stay away from them? Is this what the Bible teaches about pleasure and God? Uh, I don't think so. Yeah. I think uh, quite the contrary. The Bible wants us to continue to and has reveals that God has hardwired us to pursue our joy. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that is why we all do it. And that in actual fact, this is just a, a, an alternative pathway to joy to joy that will be actually full and lasting. Uh, and so the Bible is, uh, presents a God who wants us uh, to find full and ultimate and eternal and infinite joy uh, in Him. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay, well, maybe we'll have a bit of a look at what the God has to say on the topic. As part of Logos Live, we reflect on the Scriptures. And today's passage comes from the New Testament book of Hebrews. Hebrews 11, 23 to 26, which says... By faith, Moses' parents hid him for three months after he was born because they saw he was no ordinary child and they were not afraid of the king's edict. By faith, Moses, when he had grown up, refused to be known as the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He chose to be ill-treated along with the people of God rather than to enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin. He regarded disgrace for the sake of Christ as of greater value than the treasures of Egypt because he was looking ahead to his reward. Now, Moses is the star of numerous Hollywood films, including Exodus, Gods and Kings, and The Prince of Egypt. But what does this passage say about who Moses really was, and what did he do? Uh, so, Moses apparently had a six-pack abs and looked like Batman. <laughs> yep. Uh, but he like, was yeah. also... A bit, like, a bit like myself, really. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah, just yeah. like you, Rob. Yeah, exactly. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. that's right. Yeah. Uh, but he was also a Jew. Uh, but then because of uh, the King's Edict, it says here, uh, which was that every uh, firstborn male boy uh, would be killed. This is way back in uh, 14th century BC. Yeah. Um, but instead, uh, Moses' parents protected him, Moses' uh, uh, older sister. And so uh, he was eventually adopted into the Egyptian royal family, uh, brought up in the Egyptian uh, palace. Uh, but I guess he, he then had this uh, kind of fork in the road moment where he could continue uh, Obviously, in a lavish kind of life, uh, would have had the world at his feet, uh, being in the Egyptian royal family. Um, or he could choose to side uh, where his heart really was with his people, uh, the Jews who are currently oppressed by the Egyptians, 
Uh, and so then we read in the book of Exodus, which Hebrews is reflecting on, yep. uh, that um, God calls Moses to lead uh, the Israelites out of, uh, from under the hand of the Egyptians, the whole let my people go yep. uh, moment. Um, and then Moses does it. Mm. So he has his choice between what's described here as fleeting pleasure and serving Christ. Now, the passage describes sinful pleasures as fleeting. So what does it mean for pleasure to be fleeting? Yeah, I think it uh, speaks to uh, the temporariness of uh, sinful pleasure. Mm. Uh, it's, it's short. It's not lasting. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's not fulfilling. Yep. It's here today, gone tomorrow. Yeah. And th- is that the case, do you think, with all pleasure? Uh, if we're speaking of pleasures to be experienced in the here and now, I think so, yes. Uh, I think, as I said before, I think the Bible is presenting that there can be a, a deep and lasting and abiding pleasure mm. uh, in God. But if we're talking about, uh, I guess, sensory pleasures, mm. uh, I, I would think so, yes. Yeah. Any examples come to mind of pleasures that you see as being fleeting? or Yeah, so just to think uh, in our world today, uh, I, I guess one of the uh, pleasures uh, that people run to is sexual pleasure. Uh, particularly uh, for men, there's uh, the, issue, the issue of pornography. Uh, and so I was reading uh, recently in The Age, uh, this guy... Uh, who described his first uh, experience uh, of developing an addiction to pornography as like a kid in the candy store, uh, a little boy in a lolly shop. But then he continues to talk about the destruction that pornography had on his life to the point where uh, it was not something that he was enjoying, it was, it was a chore. Uh, it was something that was destroying uh, his relationships, destroying his marriage, destroying his life. Uh, and I think that totally just speaks to this truth that um, these kind of pleasures are maybe pleasures for a moment, uh, but in the totality of our experience of them, they're not pleasures at all. ultimately destructive. Yeah. Yeah, if you make them ultimate, perhaps. Um, totally, yeah. So is this saying, though, therefore, that all pleasure is sinful? Uh, I don't think so. No. So uh, you mentioned uh, Antony of the yep. third century. Sure. Um, One of my heroes. <laughs> <laughs> so guys like him will have had a view of the world that, that the world is dark and the world is to be retreated yeah. from. Yeah. Uh, we need to pull ourselves out uh, because uh, all of it, pleasures uh, included, are bad. Right. Uh, whereas I think uh, the Bible presents uh, a world as created by God as good uh, and as something to be enjoyed, something as he, Paul writes in uh, 1 Timothy, to be things that are to be received uh, with thanksgiving and prayer. Uh, and so... Yeah, I think there are pleasures to be had in the world uh, that God has designed us to experience, giving us the, the taste, touch, feel, senses. Uh, you know, if we got hungry, rather than uh, having taste buds to enjoy food, he could have made us have a headache uh, by eating. Um, <laughs> so and so eating would become a chore then. Yeah, yeah. totally. Yeah. Where it seems like God wants us uh, to enjoy uh, these things in the world. So I think there are pleasures that... Uh, had an experience in the right way, uh, can be even more fulfilling uh, than apart from God. Okay. Well, this passage does create a comparison. The fleeting pleasures of sin are compared with and regarded as disgrace for the sake of Christ. Moses lived a long time before Jesus Christ. How can Moses choose Christ if Christ wasn't even alive? Yeah, so this book of Hebrews is written in the first century, reflecting back uh, on the life of Moses. And so, Essentially, the word Christ uh, is the Greek word for Messiah, uh, the Hebrew word Messiah, uh, which uh, was the coming one, uh, the Lord who was going to come and uh, redeem his people, Israel, restore everything that was broken, right, the wrongs that they were experiencing. Uh, And Moses knew the promises of God. God, before Moses, uh, way back in Genesis 3, at the very beginning, uh, had promised that there would be a seed of the woman who would come and crush the seed of the serpent. And so this is him. Uh, This is the Messiah who Moses, as we, as myself, being a Christian, uh, look back on the Messiah and by faith trust in his person and work uh, on my behalf on the cross and in the resurrection. Mm -hmm. Uh, Moses was looking forward Mm to the person and the work of the Messiah in his place. So he's kind of trusting in Christ or following Christ, even though he doesn't quite know who he is. Yeah, totally. There were uh, not all was yet revealed, um, but he was still trusting in Christ. So why did Moses choose Christ then rather than the fleeting pleasures of sin? Evidently, because he was better. Uh, Moses, I'm sure like us, had that pursuit of happiness, that pursuit uh, of joy. Uh, And so he will have waited up, I 
kind of picture it is that he's at a, he's at a fork in the road here between uh, pleasures of sin and Christ. Uh, and he saw Christ as better. Uh, he believed Jesus and following that path, even though it would include mistreatment. Uh, he believed it would be a much more fulfilling life, but also he had an eternal perspective uh, and it would be there that his life and his jo- enjoyment would be full and lasting. So what does this then mean uh, for the relationship between pleasure and sin? Well, I think pleasure itself is not sin. Mm-hmm. Uh, we need to be clear on that, that we can have pleasure, but had it in the right way. And that right way is not making uh, that thing that we are trying to get happiness from or pleasure from the ultimate thing, but instead having God, having Christ, having uh, Jesus as the ultimate place in our life then frees us to enjoy all other things as they were created to be enjoyed and not rather make made making gods out of them. Mm. So... You mentioned before that Moses chose Jesus because he was better. Well, what makes Jesus better? Well, we uh, in the Psalms it says uh, God has made known to us the path of life. In His presence there is fullness of joy. At His right hand pleasures forevermore. Uh, that speaks to both the uh, infiniteness, but also the eternality of the pleasure. And I think in Christ, uh, in Jesus, we will have pleasure uh, fully and forever. Uh, full enjoyment and forever. It will not be fleeting. It will not be temporary. It will not be here today, gone tomorrow. Uh, But in eternity with him, it will be here today, more tomorrow, more the next day, uh, and on and on for eternity. That is one thing that is better and I think a very convincing thing. The other thing is that Jesus is not just an object that we receive pleasure from. Uh, He is a person, a person who has pursued us uh, in his uh, life and death in our place and in his resurrection, uh, defeating Satan's sin and death. He has pursued us. He actually wants us to find our joy in him. And so there's a sense of being known by Jesus, of being free from, uh, because of his payment on the cross, being free from our, uh, the guilt and shame of uh, all that we've done in rejecting him. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so there is great freedom, uh, which again is a great joy. Uh, there is relationship, which is a great joy. Uh, so yeah, many things make uh, Jesus better. Well, a question has just come through. Is the trajectory of the Bible towards pleasure? What of the wedding feast of the Lamb? Totally. I think uh, that question and the answer in it is uh, spot on. Yes, I think uh, we see in the beginning, uh, in the garden, Adam and Eve, all things were created for them to enjoy. God wanted their uh, pleasure. He wanted their pleasure in obedience by not eating from a certain tree. And he wanted their pleasure in relationship uh, with him. Uh, We see that being broken by us by humanity, by uh, our rejection of him and our independence from him. Mm -hmm. Uh, But then we see for the rest of the Bible leading up to that uh, wedding, the marriage feast of the Lamb, God coming into the world, God covenanting with his people uh, to save them from this brokenness and then also to, in the book of Revelation, renew the world uh, so that we might experience it as uh, he wants us to uh, and experience him fully apart from the brokenness uh, that we experience mm. now. So yes, <clears throat> totally. I think there is a trajectory toward pleasure. Well, even in, in that question, the illustration or the example of used of a wedding feast, I mean, can you think of a wedding where you have actually thought, well, this is actually a real big bit of a drag. I can't wait for this to go. It's like it's usually an enjoyable experience, isn't it? A, w- a wedding, a wedding feast. Yeah, totally. Uh, and I suppose you even, Especially that's why when, when you get wedding out. invitations, you're kind of looking forward to, you know, you're on the A list or the B list. You get invited to the feast. Sometimes I'll even skip the wedding ceremony so I can just get to the, the feast. And I suppose underlying that is because it's actually pleasurable, isn't it? We enjoy our food. And- to be honest, sometimes I go to weddings for the food. <laughs> <laughs> I shouldn't say that, should I? Uh, it's okay. It's just going out to lots of people on radio. So. <laughs> we have a couple of moments for questions from the floor. Yep. Right. So if, like what you say is right, why are Christians often so not on about pleasure? Mm. Like why, why the impression that God's killed you? Oh, I think because we're broken too. Uh, we are sinful as well. We don't always apply uh, the truth that I, I know from my own experience. I uh, am here and have been asked the question and so I can answer it. But in, uh, you know, the... Uh, flow of life sometimes i'm not applying it and reminding myself uh, of uh, the great truths and of just how beautiful christ is uh, so i think that seeps into all of us and that uh, we uh, all therefore minimize our joy by not dwelling on just what uh, jesus has done for us uh, and so that may be the answer the other thing i think is to say that it is not 
I don't think God's speaking of a right now full and lasting uh, joy experienced uh, right now. Jesus himself was called the man of sorrows. Paul said uh, that he was sorrowful yet always rejoicing. There is deep sorrow uh, and suffering in this life uh, and the promise of God and what Moses was um, clinging onto by faith uh, and Christians are called to cling onto by faith is that one day Jesus is returning so that all uh, sorrow would be put away, uh, all tears wiped and pleasure forevermore. Mm. Could you also say, maybe even add to that and suggest that uh, Christians don't necessarily exemplify joy because we often want to make pleasure ultimate. Yeah, with the, totally. With yeah. That also I would agree. Yeah. We, that's, that's one of the, uh, I guess, bad fruits of our brokenness, that we will uh, replace God and make a God of something else, uh, pursuing yeah. pleasure or something like that. How can a person then experience this joy in God? I think that Hebrews passage goes some way toward answering it, and that is by faith. Uh, it says that by faith, Moses uh, chose to Jesus over the fleeting pleasures of sin. And I think that's what the Bible calls us to today, that, uh, as I said, there are going to be circumstances in life. I mean, just looking around at the world, there is much brokenness and suffering. Uh, But by faith, we believe that Jesus really did live in my place, in the believer's place. Uh, He really did die in my place for my sin, that he really did rise again, uh, and that by faith, he really is returning to consummate that at the marriage supper of the Lamb, and he really is coming back for us so that we will uh, be brought to God to experience that fullness of pleasure forever. Uh, So I think yeah, experiencing it by faith means that now, As I mentioned before, I'm now set free from pursuing happiness. I can pursue God and happiness will come as a byproduct. I can look forward to it. And so now I really don't have to, as you were saying, put other things in the place of God. I can enjoy them as as they were made to be enjoyed. God versus pleasure. Is God just a cosmic killjoy? Dun dun. (laughs) No, not at all. Joy itself is found in God. Well, let me leave you then with the Logos for the day. Moses chose to be ill-treated along with the people of God rather than to enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin. He regarded disgrace for the sake of Christ as of greater value than the treasures of Egypt because he was looking ahead to his reward. I look forward to you joining us next time for Logos Live. Please thank our guest today, 